welcome everyone once again. We are so happy to have you here in today's session. Um, our session today is in partnership with KRA. It's a tax compliance webinar and it's themed a practical guide to navigating tax compliance for businesses in Kenya. We are delighted to have you here. So we'll start off our session. As we move along, we encourage you to introduce yourself in the chat box. Tell us about your business. Um, tell us your name, the, the organization that you're joining us from, your designation at that organization. Share with us your website or your LinkedIn profile, as well as the location that you're operating uh, from. We encourage you to just interact so that we can also get to know one another and uh, um, discuss more beyond this session. So we'll move along. Um, so to introduce Invest in Africa, Invest in Africa is a not-for-profit not private sector organization um, whose mission is to empower micro, small and medium enterprises in Africa to create sustainable jobs. So for this reason, we have convened a rich network same mission and um, same mission. And um, looking at the slide that we have there, you can see some of the partners that we work with. We work with corporate partners, we work with buyers, we work with financial partners, we work with development and advocacy partners, and we also work with the government and government agencies. And our primary stakeholder are the small and medium enterprises, but we also work with uh, business membership organizations. So we have a unique technology platform um, called Biashara.now, where we use this platform to provide SMEs with better access to skills, markets, and finance. And we are operating in four countries in Africa. We have Kenya, we have Ghana, Senegal, and Mauritania. And that's all about Invest in Africa. You can look at the meeting chat box just to see a link to our website so that you can uh, find out more about our work. So we have some key thematic areas of focus. There are five of them. Our overarching theme is SME resilience. So we are working to ensure the sustainability and the resilience of enterprises across Africa. So our key thematic areas of focus, number one is disaster risk management, where we are championing for an all of society approach towards a holistic view of disasters and shifting the focus from disaster response to disaster management, preparedness and mitigation. Another key thematic area of focus for Invest in Africa is agriculture and food, where we are driving the growth and scale of SMEs to contribute sustainably towards food systems and also towards food security. We have JESSE, where we, um, this is the gender equality and social inclusion. So we are driving sustainable development by fostering inclusion of marginalized groups, that's women, youth, people living with disabilities, and the economically marginalized. And uh, just to be able to contribute more towards enterprise growth and prospering of African economies. And then we have environmental sustainability and climate action, where we are championing a transition of enterprises towards adoption of environmentally sustainable practices. And finally, we have infrastructure development, where we are empowering the development of resilient production structures and systems to enhance SME value through industrialization and value addition. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. I can see some people are introducing themselves on the chat box. Good morning, Kevin. Good morning, Kemboy. Good morning, Elsie. Nice to see you here. Thank you for joining. Good morning, Judy, Shelmith. Thank you. So our impact in Kenya to date. So in terms of the jobs that we have supported as Invest in Africa, we have 83,420 jobs that we have supported. On our Biashara Now platform, which I have mentioned, we have over 5,000 SMEs who are registered there and we continue to support them to access skills, markets and finance. We have over 7,000 SMEs that we have trained through our various uh, diverse training programs. And finally, we have 9.5 million US dollars that of finance that have been accessed by SMEs through financial linkages coming from IIA and our financial partners. 
So today's session, as I have said, is about uh, tax compliance. So we will be talking about uh, tax compliance for SMEs in Kenya, as we have realized that uh, many SMEs are facing challenges in becoming compliant, and this is leading to hefty fines and sometimes even closure of businesses. So today our webinar is brought to you by ourselves and um, our partners, Kenya Revenue Authority, KRA. So they'll be shedding more light on how you can achieve compliance in your business. We are delighted to have you all here and there will also be sufficient time for you to ask all the questions that you have to KRA. So today we have Mr. Hans Aling who is in the individual business compliance uh, department at KRA and we also have Mr. Lupa, Luca Chepngar sorry, who is a manager for the domestic tax department and also individual business compliance at KRA. So feel very free to interact with them as much as possible. We are all looking forward to learn from you. So Mr. Luke, Mr. Hans, feel very uh, welcome and uh, you can take it over from here. Welcome. Thank you so much. Uh, this session generally is going to focus on uh, the types of businesses that are normally conducted by SMEs. So as the authority, we do, foc we do acknowledge uh, and we are cognizant of the fact that there are very many SMEs in Kenya, about 7.4 million micro enterprises. And uh, SMEs are the ones that employ a major um, amount of people in the country. And 93% normally are normally employed, normally employed between one and 10%. So this session is just to, be able to take you through the understanding of the tax laws and the regulations that are required and uh, the tax compliance requirements for the businesses that uh, you might be engaged in and give you a broad understanding. And also, we are also here to facilitate and just provide capacity by ensuring that we answer some of the questions that uh, or the queries that you might have. Uh, there was uh, questions that were shared beforehand and uh, we have recorded them down and we might also just provide insights into some of the concerns that you have based on the questions that you had asked. Next. Uh, so these are the objectives that uh, we might get from this particular training. You will be able to understand the statutes or the laws on taxation based on the particular in, uh, businesses that you're operating in. Uh, you'll be able to have an understanding of the impact of taxation in business, and we'll also be able to appreciate the purpose of audits and investigations. And we will take you through the procedure for audit and investigations and what it entails, and also what you as a taxpayer or as our stakeholders are supposed to do and your obligations in cases where you are being audited. And we'll also give you a brief uh, a brief view on the tax compliance requirements for the businesses that you are currently engaged in. Now, we have uh, several tax categories, and uh, these are normally business income. Uh, pay as you earn, which are employment taxes, uh, withholding taxes, advanced taxes, capital gains taxes, tax on rental income, and turnover tax, and I'll explain them briefly. Business income is generally that particular income that you are earning or is accruing from the businesses that you are currently engaged in. You are supposed to declare this particular income in your income tax returns, annual income tax returns. In cases of company, a company will file corporation tax returns. And at this particular stage, we should be aware that the tax rate is normally 30% for residents. And uh, the pay as you earn or employment taxes, these are normally just taxes that are deducted at source. This is income that is remitted by your employer, not you, by your employer. So 
those engaged in uh, businesses and have employees earning above 24,000 per month should ensure that they register a payee obligation and that they file those tax returns that they have deducted at source from their employees and withheld them, they need to remit it in KRA. It's an agency tax. So you are acting on behalf of KRA and giving that or remitting that income in KRA on behalf of your employees. Remember, as we said again, it is on employees who are earning above 24,000 per month. So the main thing that employees should actually do, because it is not a final tax, at the end of the year, that particular employee before June uh, 30th, which is the deadline, they are supposed to file their returns and declare that income based on the P P9. You as the employer, you are supposed to issue that particular employee with a P9 form. And this particular employee can actually take advantage of uh, particular reliefs, which they might deduct. Now, the CGT capital gains tax, uh, we also need to be aware that uh, the law was reviewed. Capital gains tax was formerly at 5%. It is now at 10%. At 15%, uh, this takes effect as of January 2023. So, any transactions that were entered into or concluded or execution of sale agreements that were done prior to January 2023 are subjected to the 5% tax. It's also a tax that also applies to transfer of shares, especially with regards to companies. Now, I will focus majorly on turnover tax because I know that this is a particular tax that will apply to SMEs basically. Uh, the authority had had several conversations and uh, several meetings with SMEs with regard there was uh, issues to do with uh, the lack of simplicity to file returns. So KRA had taken steps to actually engage SMEs with regards to this. Uh, the rate before was at 300 and actually SMEs were of the fact that this rate should be brought downwards and KRA was able to implement this the rate at now is 10 is actually 1% of the gross sales that you have made whether or not you have incurred any expense, any losses or gains you are just supposed to take that 1% of the sales that you have actually done and uh, that 1% is what you just remit to KRA so the legal provisions and the revenue statutes that apply to us and the main ones that we will uh, be focusing on are the six that are listed there. The first one is the Income Tax Act, the Value Added Tax Act, the Tax Procedures Act, the Excise Act, the Excise Duty Act, and the ESC Custom Management Act. The Income Tax Act is uh, a tax that is levied on gains based on businesses. This is a tax that is paid by the, a person who is engaged in business or who is actually getting income based on a gain. Let's say a sale of property, someone who is uh, engaging in uh, selling cars, it can be anything for that particular matter. Now, value added tax, something has to come out clear. We need to understand that this is an indirect tax. It is not a direct tax. By indirect tax, I mean that the incidence of tax in this case falls on the consumer. So the businesses that you are currently engaged in, this VAT that you are collecting, it is not tax that is imposed on you. It is tax that is imposed on the end consumer. What, you add, what uh, businesses should just do is register for that VAT obligation and ensure that before the 20th of the following month that they file and remit that particular tax to KRA. The Excise Duty Act generally is for 
we used to call it a syntax, but uh, the scope of what constitutes the products that are captured, or we normally call them excisable goods, under the Excise Act has been broadened to include such things such as beverages, soft drinks, uh, things to do with cosmetics. Uh, we also have fees that is normally charged on money transfers nowadays, which uh, is subject to excise. And uh, issues, beverages such as mineral water, tobacco, and the sorts. And the rates are normally different. And uh, they are normally subject to adjustment, and the law provides for that. And it's the Commissioner General who actually lists the adjustment based on inflation. Then obviously we have the East African Custom Management Act, which actually applies to imports or products that have been imported or goods or services into Kenya. Now, uh, when it comes to taxation of business income, that income that KRA is taxing is a gain. KRA cannot tax something that does not exist, and it has to be taxable within the law, or it has to be codified within the law. What we need to know is Kenya is a source country, so we normally tax income that has accrued within Kenya for business. If you have engaged in business and that particular business, that income has accrued within Kenya is what we normally tax. Or probably business income that is partly in Kenya or partly outside Kenya. So as we have stated, we tax the gains or profits that have accrued or that have derived in Kenya. The main forms of businesses in this case that we normally target are sole proprietorship, and this might apply to most of you, uh, partnerships and uh, companies which now normally pay corporate tax. This corporate tax is at 30% or 37.5% for non-residents. 30% is for residents of Kenya. So when one is conducting business, it is paramount to actually know whether you, if you are a sole proprietor, whether you are registering as a resident or a non-resident. If you decide to register as a non-resident, then that's, the tax rate will be different at that 7.5%. And if one decides to register as a resident, then the tax rate will be at that particular uh, 30%. Also, we need to know that this is income that is wholly in Kenya or wholly accrued or partially accrued within this particular jurisdiction since I've already stated that we are a source country and we tax that income that has actually accrued within this particular jurisdiction. So this business can include any trade or profession, vocation, and every manufacturer adventure and concerning the nature of trade, but uh, it does not include employment income. Employment income is different from this particular business income. As I've said, employment income is still taxable. And if one has employees, again, you have to make sure you register for that pay as you earn obligation and remit it to carry within or before the 20th of the following month, same as VAT, meaning that if you have made sales in February for purposes of VAT, you need to have declared those sales by March before the 20th of March, because March is the preceding or the following succe succeeding uh, month. So the basis of taxation, we normally tax based on the matching concept, and that is something you need to be cognizant of, meaning that the authority or according to the Income Tax Act, you are allowed to actually deduct your expenses before you arrive at your profit. And what we have said again, we normally tax the profit or the gain. What you need to know is this particular ex expenses are provided for in section 15 and 16 of the Income Tax Act. There are normally expenses that are not allowable and there are expenses that are disallowable. So it is normally paramount that you know based on the industry or, or the trade that you're engaged in, you need to have a record of those particular expenses that you have listed and know whether those expenses 
are allowable within the law or within the tax statutes or not. Because the, most of the uh, issues that we might arise is that if you decide to deduct expenses that are not allowed within the law, then uh, these expenses might be disallowed by KRA when you are being subjected to an audit or when uh, we have information that the expenses that you have listed are not actually allowable expenses. So for every, for the gross turnover that you have, and you can see an example there of the sales revenue, you just deduct the expenses and the earnings before taxes, the income tax expense. You arrive at the net income, that is what we normally tax. And as I've indicated, for purposes of uh, ascertaining the total income of any person, there shall be sub it shall be subject to section 16, which you shall be allowed to deduct the expenditure that you have incurred during that particular year of production. What we need to note that what you are deducting or the expenses that you are deducting have to be wholly and exclusively incurred by you uh, for your businesses in the production of that income. If it is an expense that is not wholly and exclusively incurred for purposes of running your business, then that particular expense will also not be uh, allowed. We will only include the expenses that you have incurred exclusively and wholly for purposes of production of that particular income. Then we have the withholding taxes. These are normally just taxes deducted at source from certain incomes. Yeah. The, in cases of uh, withholding tax, this just generally means you might have provided a, a, a service to someone. It might be management or professional. So what normally happens when you have provided such services, there is a withholder. You, as the person who has provided the service or the sale, you are a withholder. So the, what the withholder does normally is he deducts this particular or a certain percentage of the income, which is normally 5% for residents, and remits it to KRA. What you are supposed to remit is the balance of this particular tax. What we also need to know that is at times, KRA may be able to know that you are receiving income without even you alerting KRA, because remember, this withholder who has withheld this amount will generate what we call a, with, a withholding certificate. These withholding certificates will reflect on our end. So we expect you as the withholder to remit this particular income. So the details of the withholding certificate is what you will capture when you are filing uh, your annual returns or your income tax annual returns. Some of the withholding uh, taxes, as we have said, are normally final tax and does not really require you to actually declare this particular income at the end of the year when you are filing for your income tax returns. And uh, we have examples of uh, some of the income that is subject to withholding taxes, such as pension, retirement, annuity management, profession, or training fees. These are things or probably income that relates to people like lawyers, accountants, or auditors, or, this, or, or such, dividends, interest incomes, uh, contractual fees, and legal fees, audit fees, rental income, and royalties. Now, I will come to probably where this tax heavily relates to most of you who are currently engaged in uh, SMEs. So this is the turnover tax, uh, as I've indicated. The turnover tax, what we need to know, turnover tax applies to businesses that have a turnover of more than 1 million, but less than 50 million. So if you're engaged in any business, and your gross turnover, including the cost of sales, including the expenses that you have incurred, if those particular, if that particular turn, turnover falls between one million and fifty million, is when you are liable to register for turnover tax. 
we need to know that per turnover tax before was between 1 million to 5 million. But as I've said, uh, the engagement that we have had also with uh, uh, SMEs, mm, we were of the view and uh, they were also of the view that we needed to expand this threshold also to be able to widen the tax base and capture more taxpayers who are engaged in uh, small enterprises. Now, this particular tax came into effect in 1st January 2020. What you need to know, turnover tax is a final tax. So if you have declared for this tax, there is no need to declare this income in at the end of the year in your income tax returns, in your annual income tax returns. What we had before was uh, the, or we had uh, what generally was the presumptive tax, but we do no longer have this. Uh, we normally get questions on uh, how someone needs to file for presumptive tax. We need to know that this tax does not apply based on uh, the legal judgments that were issued by the courts. There are several benefits of turnover tax because you are just paying 1% because we said the rate before is 1% of the gross sales. You just compute your sales. 1% is what you remit to carry. It reduces the expenses because taxpayers are only required to keep a daily gross sales record. So you do not have to keep much. What we also need to know is that since small uh, SMEs are not necessarily, or people who are engaged in sole proprietorship or small businesses are not necessarily required to keep audited accounts. The Companies Act is what requires companies, if you have a company and their directors, is when you are actually required to keep audited accounts. For small businesses, they are just allowed to keep proper records, as long as the records are proper. Yeah, it is a simplified filing and payment process, including payment through mobile phones. There is reduced time in filing for this particular tax and uh, paying taxes since it is very simplified and it is as a flat rate of 1%. You do not even need to deduct those particular expenses and know whether uh, which expense is allowable and which one is not allowable by dint of section 15 and section 16 of the Income Tax Act. As we had said, turnover is a, is a final tax and need not be captured again in the annual income tax return. Now, uh, we shall move on to the rights of a taxpayer, what you need to know and the rights you actually have with regards to uh, taxation. Every taxpayer who is within Kenya or who is actually engaged in any business activity in Kenya, even non-residents, have the right to be issued with a personal identification number. What we normally ask taxpayers is your documentation. So in this case, if you're a Kenyan citizen, you, will be, you can simply go and register uh, and issue your PIN. What we normally encourage taxpayers to do is uh, to approach any of our offices, nearest offices, uh, seek clarification when you are registering because uh, so that the details that are captured are not wrong. We have situations whereby taxpayers have probably gone to a cyber and uh, have registered somewhere else and the details captured are not the right details. A taxpayer is uh, is probably registered for as pay as you want and yet they do not have employees or they are registered with the obligation of value added tax and they do not qualify for that obligation. So it is important and normally our services are free. They are not offered at any, there is no fee for uh, inquiring or seeking assistance from our tax service offices. Now there's the right to confidentiality and privacy in relation to administration of tax law. So this information that we have about you is confidential and we should, should, the authority does not share it with any person or any third parties. It is just kept within us. There is also the right to be refunded. 
in case uh, you have uh, a paid or overpaid tax or with regards to, and I will uh, briefly later on touch on uh, the situations where a refund might arise because uh, that's another question that we were actually also asked. Uh, the right to object a tax decision or the right to appeal a tax decision. A tax decision can be in form of an assessment whereby the tax, the commissioner for domestic tax is coming and saying that there is an information that there is, is available with us that you have probably not remitted these taxes and we might issue you with additional assessments. You have that right to actually object when the authority has issued you with this particular objection. And also a tax decision can also be a refund decision. Now, the obligations that you as a taxpayer have is, for example, to appear before the commissioner when the commissioner is satisfied that that person has committed an offense. The commissioner under the Tax Procedures Act, which is one of the statutes that we have mentioned earlier on, has the power to summon you or ask that you enter appearance before him or her. Uh, there's also the right to produce records. As I've uh, earlier indicated, it is important that taxpayers know that records should be kept. Uh, it is actually a requirement within the law that one keeps proper records as I had earlier on indicated. With this regard, the records don't have to be complex because uh, the other question that we had been asked uh, issues with regard to how, which kind of records one needs to keep, whether one needs to engage in auditors. And we, as we have indicated, um, for purposes of turnover tax, it is simplified. It is just 1% of the gross that you have actually incurred. What you normally just need to have is because you might not necessarily need to engage an uh, auditor with regards to preparing your financial statements. The rec what you need to keep as a taxpayer is the record of all the transactions that you have carried out. That is from January to December for that particular year of income. All the revenue that you have incurred, the receipts per day of the expenses that you have incurred, the records of sale that are actually there, and the expenditure. And with regards to expenditure, we are now talking about the fact that you need to have supporting documentation of those expenses. And as we had said before, the expenses have to be allowable expenses, not expenses that are disallowable. Now, some of the obligations for SMEs is uh, to voluntarily disclose all the income and maintaining proper records, as I've stated and I've indicated which particular records are this. If one has a challenge with filing, as we have indicated, you can visit your nearest tax service office with these particular records. Our officers are normally on ground to assist you in case of any challenges. And as we have said, services within the authority are normally done for free. There is at no fee. Then this particular tax should be filed in a timely and uh, the payment should be done within the particular periods that are stated within the law. So obviously, again, because one of the questions that we had seen coming up over and over again are some of the incentives that arise particularly with regards to uh, the small, the SMEs. The law, especially the Income Tax Act, provides for several incentives. There are normally capital allowances that are there, and these can be claims that are made on uh, reducing balance method. It can be on machinery, it can be on the buildings during the starting of that particular building, it can be on farm works. Yeah. Then the other incentive is probably preferential tax regimes and uh, SMEs can actually consider being strategic, strategically located in areas that are normally demarcated by the government for business enabling policy and that have a low tax uh, rate for purposes and these are special economic zones. We also have the SEZ Act 
So you can go through it if you find the time to see some of the incentives that are normally issued with regards to taxation or the rebates that one might have. There is the export processing zones. Um, so SMEs can just take advantage and uh, invest in such regimes or such zones that actually have this particular or are actually accorded the status of an SEZ or EPZ. Uh, an example of the incentive of SEZ is with regards to income tax is that there's a normally an income tax holiday for around 10 years of the, the first year of operation. Then the next 10 years, there is a lower tax rate, which is normally at 25%. So the tax rate is no longer at 30%. So tax holiday for first 10 years, for the next 10 years, the tax rate is at 25%. And after that is when you can, uh, uh, it switches to the normal tax rate, which is now 30%, the normal income tax rate. What I had not put here or probably indicated that it's that uh, there's a voluntary tax disclosure program. Yeah. This particular program was established with the sole purpose of if there are any taxes that one has not declared between the periods of 2015, it's a five year period to 2020, and uh, you probably want to declare this tax, you can take advantage of your voluntary tax disclosure program. The beauty with this program is that we normally grant waivers on the penalties and the interest um, that might be incurred because of late filing and late declaration and late payment of this tax. During the first year, which was 2021, taxpayers were being granted a full waiver, which is 100% on the interest and the penalties. Uh, for the period 2022, uh, the authority was granting taxpayers a partial waiver at 50%. Then for these years, we are still granting a partial waiver, but at 25%. We are only waiving 25% of the penalties and the interest that you have incurred during this particular period. So these are generally for the taxes that you might not have declared. And KRA will not punish you or come after you with regards. It's voluntary. It's a voluntary tax disclosure program. And uh, it is just for purposes of uh, ensuring that there's a, I would not want to use the word amnesty, but a sort of form of amnesty so that you can declare these taxes that you have probably had forgotten to declare or you have not declared for one reason or another. Now we will move on to uh, the process of tax audits and investigations and the process of managing uh, tax audits and uh, investigations. A tax audit is generally an examination of one's tax returns by the tax authority, in this case being KRA, and they operate different from the normal financial audits. It is just generally to verify that that income that you're declaring and the deductions are actually accurate. The goals of a tax audit is just to seek and ascertain and reconcile that taxpayers' declarations and identify non-compliant taxpayers. It is not normally for punishing a taxpayer. If you are non-compliant, we make sure that we indicate the issues that you are not compliant so that in future, you will be able to actually declare the returns in a proper manner or so that you do not have any unnecessary uh, issues with the authority in future. Uh, there are some of the triggers of a tax audit. Uh, these are failure to file returns, late filing of uh, returns, or what might in the what we mean by what the triggers of a tax audit is what might just lead to the authority initiating an audit on you. So failure to file returns, late filing of returns, tax refund claims. Uh, as the authority, we normally receive intelligence reports from third parties with regard to non-compliant 
um, taxpayers. And this, we have a trans, uh, a platform which is normally called the iWhistle, uh, which is generally spe specifically created for whistleblowers or those who want to disclose information that is normally happening. So this might either lead to an audit for that particular, uh, if it's an issue of investigation, then we have a department within the authority, which is uh, the investigations and enforcement department, which will now fall within their domain. Remember that tax audits are limited to a period of five years. Unless of course it is a, issue that involves fraud. If it is an issue that involves fraud, then KRA might probably request for records for more than five years. But the major tax audits that we do are normally limited for a period of five years. And that is why we normally tell taxpayers, and it is codified within the law, as we had earlier on indicated, that you keep those proper records for a period of five years. The other trigger for a tax audit might be perpetual loss making by taxpayers. There are taxpayers who are in uh, perpetually making losses for over years. So you might wonder why is this taxpayer probably not closing shop and yet or probably just they continue to engage in business. We might probably or it might be a trigger to a tax audit or constantly filing returns. The other trigger might be restructuring of companies uh, which normally may require as KRA that we initiate a clearance audit, then uh, amending returns and reputation of auditors or tax agents. There are particular auditors or tax agents that we might identify who are engaging probably in malpractices or who are helping taxpayers uh, to evade taxes. So once we see this particular person, or we have identified them, it might be a tax agent or you as a business person might have appointed this person as a tax agent. You see, there's also a difference between a tax representative and a tax agent. Because a tax, a tax agent is someone who is duly handling all your filing, your declarations, and he makes payments on behalf of you. You have given him that power and you have appointed them and communicated to the commissioner of domestic tax that this is your tax agent. So you might also not even be aware of what this particular tax agent is engaged in. If we get such tax agents and they are probably agents of various businesses, then this might trigger an audit on those particular businesses that this particular tax agent represents. Now, the other one is declaring expenses without declaring corresponding income. We normally expect that if we see you are deducting expenses in your income tax return, that we see a corresponding income because the assumption is that you're engaged in business and there's income that is accruing from this particular business, which should now be subject to that 30%. The other one is applications to cancel PIN or tax obligations. Mm, taxpayers might, want to cancel tax obligations and probably not provide the reasons for actually canceling these obligations. My one might opt to cancel for, uh, let's say, per se, a pay as you earn obligation and they still have employees. So if we have such information that you probably cancel and you had employees, you might probably want to know whether the declarations that you are making are genuine. Then we have the ITAC system. These are VAT automated assessments. But with regards to this VAT automated assessments, these are generally going to, we will not really be doing them anymore because right now we have a new uh, system of ETRs, which are teams upgraded, which are able to capture um, invoices based on whether these invoices are correct and they are matching with what the seller has declared and the customer. So this might probably do away with this because this was generally to identify whether invoices are matching because uh, there was a tendency of taxpayers to actually claim fictitious inputs. So that is the reason as to why ITAX was uh, automatically issuing these assessments. The other one is tax scandals that are normally there. If one is engaged in a tax scandal, it probably might, might trigger 
that this, this particular taxpayer is audited. It might even be for this year, which might lead to audits for the last five year period. Then variances between the tax return and the industry for gross or net profit. Normally we expect that the industries have different profit margins. Yeah. And there are industries that have minimal profit margins. There are those that have a large profit margin. If we see that the industry that you're engaged in has a large profit margin, let's say, say 20% profit, and yet the profit margin that you're declaring is at around 1%, then this might be either due to overstating your expenses or under declaring the income that you receive. So this might also trigger that particular tax audit. Then there's significant fluctuations in PAYE and cooperation uh, tax. What we mean by this is you find a taxpayer, for example, has told us in their tax returns that, or with regard, or this we might ask the taxpayer to provide their payrolls and such and such things. They tell us that they have 10 employees and we understand that these are full-time employees, so they are constant. So you find that a taxpayer during the month of January, February, they have declared PYE for 10 employees. Then all of a sudden in the month of March, they only remit PYE on two employees. Then at a later month, they decide to remit for 15 employees. Because we expect that the employees you have, unless you have the business has downsized or people have been laid off, we don't normally expect that that particular number needs to fluctuate it probably needs to be constant over uh, a long period of time. And what we also compare is the salaries and wages that you have expensed in your income tax returns. Sometimes taxpayers expense a high salary and which is the, the, the expense that they have incurred with regards to paying their employees. And then yet when you look at their pay by return, you find that they are filing zero returns. That will trigger, may, may be triggers to an audit because we are expecting if you have incurred uh, salaries, expenses, and wages in a particular period, that you are telling us that you have employees. So if you have employees, we, know, we normally expect that you should, but uh, in sense, declare pay YE or pay as you earn, a payment return, not an in return or a Now, as I've stated, the audit periods are normally five years for domestic tax department or even customs, any uh, audits undertaken by the authority. Now, the burden of proof, uh, we had earlier on indicated that um, we might ask for records for more than five years if it involves fraud cases. But in cases of fraud, you need to know that it, the burden of proof is on care to actually prove that you are actually involved in uh, fraud. So the tax, you as taxpayers should retain this document for a period of five, five years. And uh, this is uh, in consonance with the uh, section 23 of the Tax Procedures Act, Act, the TPA, the Tax Procedures Act. Now we move on to the audit, audit process. So in this case, we are saying that if before even the audit process, if KRA asks you for records for more than the last five years, then you have a right to question KRA as to why they are asking for these particular records. So the first process of, with regards to what is involved in the audit process is the notice of intention to audit. Based on the triggers that we have just indicated, yeah, the commissioner will issue a notice of intention to audit, you must be told. And these are even things that are within the law, the Fair Administrative Justice, the Fair Administrative Act. We, we normally try as much as possible to give someone a fair opportunity to also defend themselves. So this notice is uh, given by the tax commissioner and the notice will normally have the areas that we are auditing. If we are auditing, issues to do with the VAT obligation, pay YE obligation, rental income tax, custom taxes, we will be able to tell you on that particular uh, notice. Now the notice 
normally has the the date that the audit is set to commence, the venue of how when the audit will be done. The audit in this most mostly in these cases is performed at the taxpayer premises, but we also have desk audits in that we can ask a taxpayer to provide records, and these particular records might go. Uh, might land on our officer's desk and my, our, our officers might just initiate or conduct the audit at uh, the premises of the authority. So at this particular stage, normally it is advisable that you engage the services of a tax advisor, if you so wish, or ensure that all documents have, uh, have been submitted to KRA. If you do not have these documents, it is very imperative that you indicate to the commission why you cannot provide these documents and the reason as to why you are not able to provide these documents. That one is very important. The documents can even might have been destroyed there. It, it might be because of several reasons. And also at this point, if you have a tax agent who you have appointed, then you need to have advisors or those tax ad, uh, advisors for that particular. Uh, tax representative, whichever the case. Uh, once that notice, well, once that has been issued, the next step is the notice of assessment. If, uh, and according to section 93 of the Tax Procedures Act, if you find that you have committed an offense and there are taxes that are arising, then the commissioner will be able to assess you and uh, issue you with a notice of assessment. Remember the rights that we had indicated right earlier on. This right is there in section 51 of the TPA. You have a right to objection. When you're objecting these assessments, remember you have a 30 day period to object. Then the objection decision is issued within a period of 60 days by the authority by our independent review of objection. If we do not issue an objection within 60 days, it means that that particular objection stands. Whatever you have objected to stands. There are circumstances where you can issue a late objection, but this has to be because of reasonable reasons. Either you have been, you are sick, or this particular taxpayer had been incapacitated, or was even outside the country, but you have to com communicate to the commissioner when you are applying for a late objection. Yeah. And uh, objections are normally again applied through the system, unless of course, if it is late. If it is not within the 30 day period, then even ITAX will not be able to allow you to apply for this particular objection. Then the last part of the audit process is normally the audit uh, findings. Now, upon us uh, getting the triggers and notice of intention to uh, audit based on the triggers that were there and issuing uh, assessments, the commissioner issues a preliminary audit report to you, highlighting its findings from the audit process and the expected uh, tax liability arising. The commissioner may also ask you at this particular stage just to probably uh, provide additional information or additional documentation to clarify on any issues if there are emergency, uh, uh, any emerging issues. Uh, during this period, this is normally the first opportunity to engage in dispute resolution. You as a taxpayer have a chance to negotiate and close all contentious issues at this particular time. Now I've talked about the validity of objection and uh, it has to be within those 30 days. Remember again, you as the taxpayers have grounds to appeal an objection decision. If you think it does not favor you or if you have substantial grounds, you can object to the tax appeals tribunal. And the process of this is actually listed in the tax appeals tribunals act. You might have to do a memorandum of appeal and submit it to the tax appeals tribunal. If it is allowed, then the tax appeals tribunal can actually hear that case. 
And during this period, you can still be referred to our alternative dispute resolution. The case can be referred back to uh, our alternative tax appeals uh, tribunal. The parties, both parties, you as the taxpayer or us, may apply to the tribunal to resolve the dispute through our ADR frame, resolution framework. And that particular framework will be transcribed in writing or the decision that will be issued will be transcribed in writing and signed by both parties, you as the taxpayer and us, and a witness yeah, who is normally an alternative dispute resolution uh, facilitator. So that is the process of the appeal. In case you, you are before the TOT, you are before the tax appeals tribunals and you still want to seek alternative dispute resolution mechanisms. Now, as I've said, uh, with issues of fraud, uh, caring conducts investigations where there is fraud, tax evasion, or willful neglect by a taxpayer. Now, there are, uh, there are, very, this, there are various decisions that we need to know between uh, tax evasion uh, and tax planning. Yeah? Tax evasion is just generally the act of reducing your act, uh, liability through illegal means, either escaping to pay taxes illegal means. It involves just uh, non-payment or underpayment of tax, either through misrepresentation or either concealing facts or affairs to the tax authority, yeah? Probably by in reporting incorrect returns and accounts or just deliberately failing to file these returns. Now, as I've stated, tax fraud is contained in section 95 of our Tax Procedures Act, and it includes omissions of amounts that ought to have been included in a return, either claiming a relief or a refund to which one is not entitled to, making incorrect statements which reduce uh, your tax liability, preparing false books or engaging in falsification of documents or records which you are providing to KRA or which you are keeping or deliberately defaulting on an obligation that you have been imposed under tax law. It can be excise VAT. And obviously there's a sanction for that. There's a fine not exceeding 10 million shillings if one is found guilty of that and it's contained under section one of four of our tax procedures act. Now, as I've said, there's a major difference between tax avoidance and tax evasion in that tax avoidance is normally aimed at reducing your tax liability through means that are not intended by the law, either exploiting or taking advantage of the loopholes in law, or bending the law to interpret the law mischievous. Tax avoidance is thus legally exploiting the tax system to reduce your liabilities. Tax planning is what is legal. So there's tax evasion uh, and uh, there's tax avoidance and there's tax planning. Tax evasion is you can be prosecuted for that under the law. Uh, tax evasion as well, but tax planning is different. And tax planning is just generally the act of reducing your tax liabilities by taking advantage of incentives provided for in law. Yeah. We had mentioned some of the incentives that apply to uh, SMEs. Uh, it can be investment by individuals in home ownership plans. Uh, those who qualify for mortgage relief, you can include that. Uh, we had stated some of the capital deductions or the capital investment incentives that exist, taking advantage of EPZs and the likes. So tax planning is generally lawful within the law. So the indicators of tax evasion are there, either failure to register for tax, to provide information, as I've said, providing false or falsifying books, providing misleading information. Again, I think I will not belabor much of this because I stated them earlier, using forged documents, fraudulently obtaining refunds uh, and the likes. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I think we've come to the end of our session. Uh, if there are any burning uh, questions or issues that may or you may want us to address, this is actually the right time.
Thank you so much, Hans, for a very elaborate presentation. I believe it has really shed light on uh, different issues when it comes to tax for SMEs. So as Hans has directed, if you have any questions, you can either type in the chat box or raise your hand and we will direct them to him. Feel free to raise your hand or share in the chat box. There were also a few questions that were asked and probably I might take this opportunity to actually just uh, address some of them. There was a question on how one gets waivers and uh, the scenarios. Waivers are normally based on case by case um, scenarios. It is based on the merit of your case. A waiver can either be full or partial. It is not certain that a waiver is a full waiver. You might be granted a partial waiver or a 50% waiver, depending on the situations. Normally, we have taxpayers who have registered for a wrongful obligation. These taxpayers, we will grant them waivers when they want to have those obligations removed. It might even be a student who does not own a business. In most circumstances, these waivers will be granted. For purposes of uh, for purposes of uh, a waiver, this you have to apply that waiver through the system, ITAC system. Visit your nearest tax service office and ensure that. Uh, you go to the debt department, your account manager at the debt department. After you have applied for that waiver, you will communicate with him and see whether this waiver can be granted. If there are challenges with regards to getting your account manager, because this is also a question that was asked, how does one know an my account, or be able to identify my account manager? You can uh, write to call center, at kra.go.ke, you will be able to get your account manager. Or the number that is normally there for our call center is 0711 099999. 0711 099999. Again, 0711 099999. You can equally if you have challenges with the account manager, we also have a complaint channel. It is dtd complaints at kra.go.ke. dtd complaints at kra.go.ke. What the complaints team does is they get in touch with your account manager who is supposed to handle all your tax issues and uh, be able to inform them to be or to be able to re resolve your issue within time. I've seen on the chat that there's a question here by Margaret. Thank you, Margaret. What does it mean when KRA puts a company on a special table? A company or an individual might be placed on a special table. Special table applies to um, taxpayers who have registered for VAT. And I also need to make this clear. I did not mention this earlier on. If you are doing any sales or you're engaged in any sales above 5 million annually, you need to register for VAT. If the sales are below 5 million, then you should not register for VAT unless you want to do so voluntarily. Sometimes you find that you want to register for VAT because some of your customers want to claim inputs. So it might force you to actually register for VAT. But VAT, the threshold, is for persons who are between five, are above the five million threshold on an annual basis. So if even if you have registered for tax turnover tax, and your VAT and your gross turnover is above five million, then you need to um, register for VAT. If you do not register for this, then care the authority might take action on you. It is there within law. So again, special table applies for taxpayers who have registered for VAT. Special, the taxpayers who are on special table are either taxpayers who are consistently filing nil returns or taxpayers who are non-filers. So you are placed on that special table so that you can come and inform KRA. If you are a non-filer, it might be because you do not know that you have the obligation. And at this point, you apply for removal of that obligation through the system, go to your nearest tax office, liars with your account manager, give the relevant documentation, apply for this uh, obligation removal, this obligation removal, 
will be removed based on the information that we have. If we are satisfied that you are not either engaging in vertebral supplies or goods or services that attract VAT. The other person who or group of persons or companies that will be placed on special table are companies that we have information were either involved in missing trader, missing buyer schemes. These are taxpayers who are claiming fictitious inputs. Mm -hmm. If we have information that you are claiming fictitious inputs so that you can lower your tax liability, so that you can, and this might probably prompt you to be placed on special table. Remember if you're on special table, you cannot file your VAT returns. You cannot uh, take advantage of inputs. And right now, currently, as we speak, you will not be able to issue someone with an ETR receipt or conduct your trade. Because as we said, the new ETR machines are teams upgraded. If you're on special table, you will not be able to do this. So it will probably prompt you to visit your KRS station and so that you are lifted from that particular special table. The other group of people we have on special table is what we call continuous credit filers. We expect that taxpayers remit VAT that they are collecting from their customers. Those who have more purchases or are claiming more purchases might probably be in a continuous credit filing. These are the people we call so that we can be able to verify their tax position by verifying whether those purchases or inputs they are claiming are genuine. Yes, yes, there is also another question. Also clarify that business that make professional fees and management fees are exempt from TOT. This is very true, yeah? What we mean by the exempt from VAT is that, uh, and these are people, as I said again, these are people who are offering services like legal services, uh, audit services, um, financial consultancy services. For them, they cannot be registered under uh, turnover tax. They have to file under the income tax uh, annual regime, deduct the expenses, and subject that profit to 30% tax. Yes, there's another question that I had mentioned that small companies, those whose turnover is 50 million are exempted from external audit. No, no, no. What I had indicated is that the companies that, or businesses that qualify for TOT as the ones that are, their turnover is between 1 million to 5 million. What I had stated is like businesses that fall within sole proprietorship because I've given the types of businesses. Someone who is involved in sole proprietorship probably has not registered a company. Company pins start with P. So if your company, if the business pin that you're operating in starts with A, then you are considered as an individual who is conducting business. That is a sole proprietor. A sole proprietor is not allowed to keep audited accounts. Businesses under the Companies Act are normally required to keep audited accounts, their financial statements. So that is what we mean by companies. This only relates to companies. It does not, those whose uh, pins start with P or even partnerships, they are particularly supposed to uh, keep those audited accounts. Uh, there's another question. If an organization does online trainings on environment and are supposed to pay VAT on the project funds, that is Godfrey. I can't get your question well. But generally, uh, any business activity being done by any business person, you have to make sure you are conversant with the VAT Act. The VAT Act lists the supplies and services there is when you go to the bottom of the vat act there is uh, what we call the first second the first and the second schedule the first and the second schedule 
lists the services that are exempt and the services that are zero rated. So if whatever supply you are doing falls within that particular service of exempt, means that you will not be paying VAT. If it is zero uh, rated, means that you probably you will not be paying VAT, but you are also allowed to um, take advantage or claim inputs or the purchases of that you have incurred while providing those uh, vertebral services. Now, there's another one from Paul Mulmi. What is the process of separating VAT from a personal payment? The process of cancelling, this is what we call cancelling uh, VAT obligation. The first step is that you go to your ITAX profile, go to registration, go to obligation, which now you will select the VAT obligation, then click on cancel VAT obligation. After that, you will write an official letter indicating that you want this VAT obligation removed from your personal PIN. It can be for various reasons. Either you stopped engaging in portable supplies or supplies that attract VAT. Either you have uh, shifted it to the company PIN. Uh, either you have closed business. For those reasons, you will indicate that uh, you will go to your nearest tax service station or provide this to your account manager. Your account manager will do a submission or to initiate the cancellation of this particular VAT obligation. At this point, you might be asked for various documents. Uh, you might be asked for a sworn affidavit from a commissioner of oaths or a sworn testimony, depending on uh, the requirements that your account manager gives you. You might be told to either bring your bank statements if you're conducting business, because it's by case or case scenario. So first apply and then liars with your account manager to have this obligation removed. Uh, I said earlier on, there's a, Helen, uh, if a company qualifies for TOT, are they also required to file the annual returns? TOT is a final tax. Mm, by final, I meant that if you have already filed for this TOT, you need not file for your annual tax returns. Uh, any business income, that business income that you had accrued, you need not declare it in your income tax returns. For TOT, you just file. It's 1% of the gross amount that, uh, or the gross turnover, that is what you remit to carry. But you have to fall within the threshold and as I said, uh, you need not be providing, unless of course you provide these management services, you have to fall within the qualification, meaning your turnover is between that 1 million to 50 million. And this was generally done to capture mostly SMEs. Now, there's another question from Brian Holmes, Home Conference. Is the older VAT stock ETR invoicing still acceptable in doing sales to customers or must all SMEs register in the new system? There was the electronics tax regulations uh, policy that was passed and it is a law that uh, you have to adopt these new ETRs. Currently, if you don't adopt these new ETRs, you will not be able to you will not be able to claim any inputs you will not be able to apply for any refunds it will deny you that particular uh, that particular right that you enjoy it is paramount that you liars we have a list of listed suppliers in our KRA website just visit our KRA website the list of suppliers are there who provide the ETR machines Based on the business you do, you will tell them and they should be best suited to issue you with the best electronic tax register that is uh, well equipped for doing your business. So that is what you will actually give. So that is what you will actually be able to maintain. The reason as to why we have moved to the ETR system is so that we can ease in and simplify the process of filing VAT. Remember this information, the ET new ETR upgraded um, devices, they issue you, it's on a real-time basis. So once this receipt has been issued, that particular 
data is transmitted to our team's uh, team in KRA, that particular data is captured immediately and we even have a pre-filled return. So it even reduces the time for filing a return. Remember the whole process of filing a return, you had to indicate those invoices and the sales that you've done one by one. It simplifies that process and also even simplifies the process of refunds or applying for refunds. So yes, it is a requirement and um, the deadline has already lapsed, but we are not saying that we will prosecute you for this. Once you are able to get that ETR machine, just obtain it so that you can be compliant. It is a it is uh, also in line with uh, the Tax Procedures Act, which actually indicates that the commissioner can uh, and should take advantage of the electronic systems. And if they need uh, documentation or declaration of tax returns in, an in a prescribed manner, then you need to have it in that particular prescribed manner that the commissioner has actually indicated. Thank you, Hans. Maybe you can answer the question from Kevin and then Lillian, and then we can um, close it at that. So there's something from Kevin Omondi. Uh, he asks, with the new E-teams currently being rolled, is it a must for SMEs who have not purchased the ETR to purchase uh, or wait for the full rollout of the software? This, the, the software has already been rolled out. Rolled out. It is actually a must. It is there in... Uh, electronic tax regulations, which were earlier on passed in 2016, but there were amendments that were done. Remember that we had given taxpayers a chance and the deadline for the team's rollout has been pushed immensely several times, even last year. So the deadline was last year, yeah, I believe at around June or July. So yes, it is, it is a requirement that uh, has to be there. Uh, you, there was a question again from who? From Lillian. Um, you might have missed it. Let me see. Um, she asks, please clarify on the recent directive by the president regarding reliefs. Oh, okay. Now, this was uh, a directive. Remember that reliefs are there within the law. Yeah, it is our rights. What the organization or as the authority we are saying is that reliefs have not been removed. They have been temporarily suspended because also us on our end, we have to make changes on how or prepare ourselves. There might be internal changes with regards to the process of how we issue these reliefs or exemption, but the law has not changed. The law only changes once there's a financial bill which is presented before parliament and that financial bill becomes an act and it is passed. Currently, as we sit, it has been temporarily suspended, but I am sure that the reliefs will be there, either for person with disabilities, it is just for us to be able to be work our way towards or ensuring that uh, the process of this particular, for handling these reliefs, are enhanced in a good way and actually just also in-house to be able to clean up and ensure that uh, we give you the best of services. But it is still there within the law. Okay, thank you. One last one. How does a company start or a startup treat grants received from tax exempt or foreign institutions, governments or development partners? Uh, how does that? Sorry. How, how does a, sorry, sorry, sorry. How does a startup company treat grants received from tax exempt or foreign institutions or governments or development partners? Oh, now the grants that you are receiving from these particular exempt institutions, remember you as a business might not be exempt. So the person who has been exempted in this case is the probably the institution who have issued you with this grant but in your case if you are getting a gain or you are receiving a grant then you need to declare that particular tax that you receive unless of course you might be a charitable institution you are involved in a charitable work and you qualify for an exemption 
what KRA does is a KRA will not give you an exemption until you apply for that exemption. What the issue we normally have is that someone does business, they qualify for an exemption, and they automatically assume that they will not pay that tax based on uh, their status. If the status says that they are tax exempt, no, you have to first apply for that exemption and have that exemption approved by our policy unit under domestic tax department. Once you have had that uh, exemption approved is when you can file your tax. And what we normally issue you with is an exemption certificate. It can even be someone who has a disability who is tax exempt, but if they do not apply for a tax exemption, that particular exemption will not be accorded to them. So if you, are, you believe that you are tax exempt, and these exemptions are also there in the Income Tax Act, the schedules in the first schedules in the income first schedule of the income tax act you can peruse and go to that schedule if you feel that you fall within the status of being allowed an exemption then apply for an exemption but it is not automatic okay thank you so much hans um, we'll close it off at that. Thank you so much for all your questions. Unfortunately, we are out of time, but do not worry. We have a follow-up session later in the month at tax clinic, so you'll be able to ask and have all the issues that you have in mind addressed. So no, do not worry at all. Um, I welcome my colleague Lim to just move a vote of thanks, and then we can feel free to leave the session. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Hans and Luca from Kenya Revenue Authority. We'd like to just appreciate you for making time to do this session with us. I would also like to thank all the SMEs on the call today and um, just to wish all the women a happy International Women's Day. We celebrate you and your efforts towards making the world a better place. Thank you very much. Um, also, the Invest in Africa team for putting all this together. And uh, like Jean said, not to worry about the questions that you have posted on the chat box. We should be able to follow this up with answers after the session. And please be on the lookout for the tax clinic, which is upcoming in the end of the month. The other event that is upcoming is also a procurement session where we'll be seeking to answer your questions on how you can be appealing to corporate buyers and also be able to win tenders as well. So thank you very much and have a lovely day.